everyone and welcome to the uh, lightning talks um, for the date today which I've just forgotten. Um, so uh, we have a great lineup this afternoon. Um, we've got uh, Andrea, um, Beth, Sal, uh, myself and then Rebecca um, from all over the place and I won't dwell on where they've come from or, or, or what their backgrounds are, I'll leave that to them. Um, so I'll, we will get straight into it and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end so uh, please enjoy. Over to you Andrea. Hello everyone, I'm Andrea, I'm just waiting for my presentation to load. Great, all right, yeah, so I'm Andrea, I'm a systems engineer at Becca, and I'm gonna take you quickly through um, kind of my career to date, and then talk about uh, an area that I find quite interesting, which is cabin safety and craft readiness, um, and then we'll get questions at the end. Um, so just to start, I guess, a quick background on how I got into engineering in general. Um, I chose engineering because I have always loved math and science and particularly applying that to solve problems and, and to make things. And so when I decided to uh, go to university, engineering seemed to be the best combination of all three. Um, so as you might guess from my accent, I am Canadian. So I went to school back in Canada, but there we had a general first year of engineering, which you got to take courses in a whole bunch of different things and then decide in your second year what you want to specialize in. So, uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do my second year, but went along to a presentation by the Mechanical Engineering Department, uh, which is where I found out about biomechanical engineering. So biomechanical engineering is all about things like prosthetic design, uh, designing hip implants, understanding how muscle contractions um, basically apply force to your skeletons, and that's how we move around. All of that was really interesting, and I didn't really know that biomechanical engineering was a thing before this presentation. So. Um, I was actually born with a very small hole in my heart. Um, so I had grown up going to hospitals every couple of years uh, to get scans done and got to grow up seeing these scans of my, you know, heart pumping and valves opening and closing. So I was already pretty interested in this, this area. Um, and in addition to that, I was also playing rugby uh, at the time and unfortunately was very, very injury prone as well. So uh, this topic kind of got me, uh, gave me a chance to understand how much force it actually took to tear the ligament in my knee, which I did in my very first game of my season, uh, which was unfortunate. But um, yeah, this presentation just really opened my eyes up to the possibility of what you could do with engineering and the fact of this very specific um, field of biomechanical engineering. So with that presentation, I knew I wanted to go into mechanical engineering and, and do the biomech thing. Uh, and so the rest of my engineering undergrad uh, was very much a mix of general mechanical classes as well as um, ones that were a little bit more focus. So once I graduated, um, generally uh, to continue on with biomechanical meant a master's degree. Um, but one of the things I find great about engineering undergrads is there's such a strong foundation in problem solving and ways of thinking and really just a whole bunch of transferable skills that if you want to, uh, you can go straight into the workforce from your undergrad. So that's what I did. Um, and seeing as I wasn't going the biomech route, I tried to play up the general more uh, mechanical sides of my degree and ended up getting a job at a nuclear technology company. So at the time, I had only the highest level understanding of how nuclear reactors actually worked, but again, playing out those transferable skills and that really strong um, problem solving kind of foundation, obviously they saw potential in me, so I got a role there, which was great. Um, after about a year though, uh, I kind of decided that wasn't for me and was looking for something else to do. So I started to set my eyes on New Zealand. So I had a, a family living down here, which was great, and very conveniently, New Zealand is short of engineers. So that helped me get my uh, visa to come down to New Zealand. And once again, in terms of trying to find a role down here, I uh, very much tried to play up the transferable skills uh, that I had gotten from my degree and then from my last job as well, uh, and ended up with a role at the Civil Aviation Authority here in New Zealand. So when I was in the CAA, um, I was in the certification unit, so that was largely looking at um, modifications uh, to aircraft and different system uh, design and installations. So it was kind of in this roundabout way that I was able to rediscover uh, my love of the biomech uh, side of things. And so that's when I came across the crashworthiness and cabin safety aspects of aviation. So it's quite quite wide ranging, but uh, in a nutshell, I guess you could say crashworthiness is all about ensuring uh, the aircraft is designed and built in such a way uh, that occup occupants can both survive the initial impact if there were to be a crash, 
um, but as well as the fact that they're able to evacuate after that in case of a fire um, or other issues there. So um, it sounds a little bit dark and morbid, but really all of this is done uh, with the intent of making sure that our passengers are safe for passenger compliance. So it's dark, but it's really for a good cause. So I find it very interesting. Um, lots of different uh, methods are used to kind of ensure aircraft are crash worthy. Uh, one of them being uh, dynamic seat testing. So that uh, picture in the top left you can see uh, with some aircraft uh, crash test dummies there with their face in an IFC screen. Um, but basically what this is, is dummies that are hooked up with a whole bunch of sensors are placed in uh, real aircraft seats, so the same type of seats that you would sit on on the actual plane. Uh, but they are bolted onto a sled and crashed extremely quickly. Um, and then the force that the dummies um, experience is reviewed and made sure that it's under a certain kind of um, threshold to make sure that a real passenger, if they were to um, receive a, uh, a force like that, would still be conscious and able to get up and out of their seat and evacuate from the plane. Um, so in that, other things are reviewed too. So uh, especially with the screens, obviously everybody's very much about the, the movies they watch on flights these days. Um, after the crash happens, uh, reviews are done too to see is there any broken glass on the screen that might get in your eyes and prevent you from seeing and being able to evacuate? Or you know, has the armrest broken in such a way uh, that you might not be able to escape? Um, other areas that they talk about too are fire testing. So they flame test all the cushions to make sure that if a fire does start, it doesn't spread quickly. Um, and another aspect that I really enjoyed as well was looking at uh, the safety of children on aircraft. So as you can understand, uh, their proportions are quite different uh, to adults. So a seatbelt that sits an adult across your hard pelvis um, is going to sit more in their kind of soft tummy and potentially cause injuries there. So there's designing different uh, components to make sure that they are safe too. I've got a video that I'm going to show you that hopefully will pop up. Um, this is just to show you what a dynamic seat test looks like. It happens extremely quickly. So in real life, this happens within a blink of an eye. Um, and you really can't see it unless you get a video like this to really slow it down. Um, not to scare anyone, this test in particular was done just to demonstrate. So it is not a combination of uh, seat belt, airbag, or wall that would actually be installed on the aircraft. So obviously, the dummy didn't have a great shot there. <laughs> but in real life, it would be a much better uh, combination. And of course, that's why we do the testing as well. So I might just play that one more time. It goes by pretty quick, but um, you can see the intent is obviously that the airbag would inflate in front of their face, not behind them, um, and that they would be uh, safe from the forces there. Uh, I'll just flip to my last line. I can see my time just got up here. Um, just to wrap up from there, um, once I was at the CAA uh, for about five years, I decided to move on to Becca to try a few new things. Um, between my time at Becca and um, at the Civil Aviation Authority, though, I was also a Wonder Project ambassador. So very passionate about what I've done in my roles and want to pass it on to other people and try to inspire uh, other young people to consider STEM careers. Um, and then finally, um, joined up with the Rural Aeronautical Society. So um, great to have a group of people that share the same interests, um, get some professional recognition for your experience, and just generally, yeah, have a good time. So that's it for me. And so my name is Sal Carter. I'm an aeronautical engineer. I've been an engineer for over 30 years. Um, and today I'm just going to try and give you uh, a very brief outline of the sort of things that you can get up to in a day in the life of an engineer. Okay. Um, as you can see, I'm a member of the Institution of Engineers, CPNs, registered engineer, and so on. But uh, here comes the next slide. Okay. So why engineering? Uh, usually people are influenced by personalities and events, and uh, I guess the first time I remember wanted to be an engineer was uh, watching the lunar landing uh, and thinking, my God, that looks good. Uh, probably something I should get involved with. And uh, I put a photo of, the, of a black and white TV up on the screen there. And that's literally how I remember it. But Dad borrowed a black and white TV and I sat there for days watching the whole thing. And uh, anyway, and there's a few other photos on top that show you some of the other things I got interested in. And some of the people that um, influenced me, that I read on, that sort of pointed me and pushed me towards engineering. And uh, uh, I won't go through their names because we're not going to have a lot of time. But um, engineering uh, is a journey. Journey. So it, it's a path. It's not something that just happens to you. Uh, you know, your first phase of engineering is uh, your education. Uh, I was lucky enough that. Uh, uh, after primary school, I went to a tech school or a trade school. They don't exist anymore. So 
as a 12 year old, I was learning how to use a lathe, how to weld. And uh, by the time I got out of that uh, tech school, I was well skilled in the basics of engineering and hand skills. Uh, and that again reinforced my wish to get involved into engineering. I then went to uh, university at RMIT where I got my Bachelor of Engineering in Aeronautical Engineering. But that really is the first part. When you come out of university, you, you don't learn everything, so it, which is un understandable after four years or so. Uh, there's a lot to learn. Uh, and um, I've got a list there of some of the things, some of the courses and some of the uh, CPD training that I did on the job. Uh, post my um, engineering degree and just gives you a flavor of you know what actually goes what sort of skills do you need some of the skills that you need to bring uh, an engineering product together and uh, and and send it out uh, so if you I guess if you ask me where I stand now in terms of um, engineering I, I, I see myself as a, um, the design engineer with experience and strength in uh, development, uh, commercialization, uh, and productionization. Okay, my next slide. Okay, this is this was my first real job out of university, and I consider it to be my second phase of my engineering education, which is the reality check. Uh, what really hits you when uh, you come out of university uh, and uh, you start to face real life problems. And uh, I started working for Pacific Aerospace in New Zealand as a design engineer. And um, one of the things that uh, the CEO uh, told me when he interviewed me uh, was, um, you know, we better be able to make it. Uh, we better be able to make money from it. And uh, it better be safe because you're going up with the pilots to test it. So, uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I reflect on those statements uh, all the time, but you can see that what he's saying there that is that in order to um, make a or have a viable engineering organisation, you've got to make something. You've got to be able to make it. You've got to be able to sell it that meets some kind of customer requirements, and at the same time, it obviously has to be safe. And when it comes to aeroplanes, safety is uh, paramount. So look, I'll just focus on some of the things that the some of the challenges that the company had. But effectively, we had to re relaunch our production lines uh, for the our three products at the time: the Cresco, the Fletcher, and the CT4. And the CT4 was particularly interesting because it hadn't been built for quite some time, so it was subject to a lot of uh, uh, obsolescence and uh, and a lot of um, if you like changes in materials. So. Uh, just focusing on some of those activities, my main task was to work with a team of people to redefine the configuration and take it to certification. So I've listed some of the things that uh, that we did there. Um, if we now move to a decade or so later, uh, it's like um, you know, welcome to the digital age. Uh, the uh, I was working at uh, Boeing Aerostructures in Australia. Uh, I was a project manager at the time. And uh, I was working on the 787 Dreamliner. <clears throat> and the big challenge here was really to try and integrate a global supply chain digitally. And uh, so there's thousands of engineers that want to work in, in, in this design. And uh, you know we were using a system uh, uh, called Katia in Inovia. And um, that's how it was, uh, it was put together. But my role was to manage the uh, the external design and build programs, which covered the movable, tra which covered the uh, sorry, which covered the spoilers, which are shown on the photo below here, and uh, also covered the wing track fairings, which are all here. A lot of carbon uh, stuff, uh, carbon composites, uh, highly sophisticated stuff, and we really pushed the envelope with uh, with seven eight seven. If I now go to the next illustration. This is manufacturing the components for the F-35. This was a different program because in this case here, I was working as a consultant for a company at a tier three level. Uh, and um, it was a different program in the sense that it was a, a build to print. So instead of designing something from scratch and taking it to production, our task was to take it to, to production. And uh, uh, you know, my responsibility was to embed myself in their team and transfer my knowledge and help them in uh, identifying, um, interpreting the, the RFP and responding to it. And my specific task was to look at the technical and the project management aspects of the response. 
And uh, just on that last slide, guys, um, go back to the beginning, why engineering? Well, uh, the photos here show some of the planes that I've worked on in some manner or other. And uh, I, I found it uh, fun, challenging and rewarding. And uh, some of the rules for engineering, just realise no, there are no superheroes in engineering. It's about teamwork. Uh, it's about using lessons learned. It's about applying concurrent engineering. Mentor the young ones so that everybody learns and uh, it feels comfortable about working with you. It's about lifelong learning and it's about having fun. Thank you very much. I share my knowledge and experience of being an aero engineer. Um, and in the words of the greatest showman, um, and if nothing else, sing the song to yourself twice and by the time you have, I'll be done. Um, this is me. So engineering for me started at university in Manchester. Um, some of my uni highlights, um, I joined the skydiving club and did a few jumps until I realized the weather in Manchester was rubbish. Um, and I was spending huge amounts of time waiting for the rain to stop or for clouds to move. My final year project um, at UD was comparing the results of simulated airflow over an aerofoil with wind tunnel results. I'd paint oil or stick tufts on a wing and attempt to visualize the flow, run the wind tunnel and take photos. I guess you could say I'd graduated from watching rain and clouds um, to watching paint dry, but it was slightly more constructive and it got me my masters, which got me my first job. So my first real job, it was with ANSYS Fluent. Um, I was a support engineer working with users of computational fluid dynamics software. Um, highlights for that, uh, the most interesting user for me was Red Bull Racing Formula One team, um, who I built a relationship with um, and was assigned as their primary engineer, um, which meant that I'd regularly troubleshoot their issues with the team um, and drink lots of Red Bull. Um, in Formula One, the cars aerodynamically developed over a season to a steady drumbeat um, of new designs which steadily make the car faster. So the issues I was working on were um, high accuracy, um, high stake, and they had really short deadlines. Um, CFD would help develop the aerodynamics of the car by either verifying the results that had been seen in a wind tunnel um, or by enhancing the understanding of what had been seen in the wind tunnel. Um, but all of this uh, meant that the issues demanded collaboration between teams um, and strong, robust relationships were absolutely essential. Um, notably, I guess this season, there's a new rule which restricts the amount of aerodynamic development and CFD um, testing time that a team can use based on a team's on-track performance um, with an aim to level the playing field. Um, so the slower teams, Williams, can explore more diverse aerodynamic ideas in an attempt to help them climb the pecking order. Um, the best part of, I guess, all of that was probably going to Silverstone um, in the pits, which was super glamorous and fun. Um, I then married a Kiwi and moved here to New Zealand, to Wellington. Um, and at the time, there were no major CFD users to speak of. So I joined the Civil Aviation Authority as an airworthiness engineer. Uh, being the first female engineer that ever employed brought with it some challenges, um, feelings of going back in time, um, inequality of rights and opportunities. Um, my worst experience there was um, the colleague that I sat next to was killed in the three, a 320 crash in Perpignan. Um, when aviation goes wrong, it's, it's not forgiving. Um, but there were highlights. Um, as Andrew had said, decelerating a crash test dummy strapped to an aircraft seat with a, air, um, an airbag uh, deploying from the seat belt was fascinating to see in real time. Um, inspecting a 777-300, which Air New Zealand had bought to give it its certificate of airworthiness, which is essentially a WAF on an aircraft, um, and then flying back on this empty brand new aircraft was a cool experience, if a little spooky. Um, and being part of a team, um, a wide team, updating the Australia and New Zealand kids' car seat standards to include aircraft um, 
was really rewarding as it's something that translates to my everyday life as a mum, strapping those kids in. <laughs> um, I guess overall, I travelled heaps, usually alone, and that was fun. And then I had kids and travel for work became less fun. So now I work for Defence and I can honestly say I love my job. Um, I feel so lucky to be doing something that aligns with my values, um, makes me feel like I'm literally contributing to world peace. Um, and I get to shop for big, cool stuff for the Air Force, um, which is essentially what my job is. Um, I'm also supported as a human, as a woman, as a leader, and as a working parent, which should be a given, but it's not everywhere. Um, highlights in working for Defence, um, in my job, it's, it's negotiating and landing a deal and translating that into real life output. So for example, last week, um, the Air Force celebrated the graduation of an air warfare officer that was trained here in New Zealand um, using the new aircraft and the gear um, that my team had, had used to modify the aircraft and bring it into a Hakia. Um, my current team is responsible for upgrading each of the different Air Force fleets with some new technology. It's crazy busy um, and it's complex. Um, but as a team, we're making progress, um, coming up with initiative solutions and constantly adjusting to make things work. Um, low lights of my job, um, it's hard work. <laughs> There's no Red Bull supply because I work for the government and it's not particularly gl glamorous. Um, but would I change it? No. I've got a great team that I'm privileged to lead. Um, I use my brain every day solving problems. Some are complex and engineering -y. Um, some are simple, some are awkward and peopley, um, and they're both words. But I love that I'm given the authority and the autonomy to make decisions. Um, what do I wish someone had told me earlier? I guess I had to find out for myself that who you work for and with really matters. Relationships really matter. Um, when I look back over my career, all the highlights were due to developing positive, constructive relationships. Um, finding an engineering -y role that you can do and enjoy is only part of the puzzle, um, but surrounding yourself with like-minded, value-aligned, um, supportive people is what keeps me getting up each morning. Um, and if you haven't seen it, you're missing out on the movie of The Greatest Showman. This is me. Back over to, is it Sean? And the camera worked. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, Sean Johnson. Um, sorry, I should have introduced myself before, but uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, poor form. Uh, so my name's Sean Johnson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Merlin Labs New Zealand Limited, and I'll explain what that's all about shortly. Um, and I'm the President of the Royal Aeronautical Society here in New Zealand at the moment. Um, Victorian engineer by background, but um, uh, I joined the Air Force um, pretty much straight out of school and one thing that the Air Force does very well is training um, and I'll, there's a slide that I've got dedicated to that but uh, the uh, Air Force sends all of its electrical and mechanical engineers away to a university or another training course to do a postgrad in aeronautical engineer to sort of normalize us and, and I like to say that it's um, teaching electrical engineers how to speak slowly enough so mechanical engineers can understand um, but generally I get punched in the arm when I say that. So moving along to my slides, just a quick summary of my career thus far. So I joined the Air Force in 1988 um, and had a bunch of training and there's a bit of a theme that's going to come through of this that I'll talk about later. Um, but the Air Force focuses its training on three sort of core elements. Uh, one is knowing the business and what it means to be in the New Zealand Defence Force as a professional. Um, the other element is being the best in, in your field. Um, so this is the technical excellence and competency bit, so constant uh, professional development. Um, and as Sal said, um, it doesn't end at university, in fact, that's just the beginning. Um, and then the third element is leadership um, from the bottom up. Um, everyone in the Defence Force is expected to uh, demonstrate leadership qualities from, from the day you get there, and that'll become clear shortly. So I had a pretty good time in the Air Force, um, did some pretty challenging things, uh, everything from F-16 project engineer, 
managing the Skyhawk fleet, managing the Iroquois fleet, deploying to Solomon's Timor. Uh, I ended up the project engineer for the NH90 helicopter project, um, where I spent four years in France overseeing the manufacture of our aircraft. Um, then ended up um, in software compliance for defence, and the irony there is that I always chuckle about uh, is that way back in about 1990, I asked to do some software papers and was told that there's no real need for an Air Force engineer to have any sort of software knowledge. Um, so anyway, ended up director of software. Um, and then project, uh, Director of Project Engineering and Certification, which really was looking out for certification activities for all of our um, capital acquisition and upgrade programs. And finally, Air Advisor, um, which is sort of the diplomatic post in Canberra. So lots of fun, um, some really hard work, but some really good friendships and, and family connections made there. I then joined the Civil Aviation Authority um, of New Zealand in um, 2016, um, where I was manager their weaviness, and to be fair, the job title changed several times while I was there. But big picture, um, responsible for registration of the aircraft, certification, um, certification of new aircraft and design change, and when I say responsible, managing the teams responsible for. Um, I had some really smart engineers like um, Beth and Andrea actually doing the hard work um, in those roles, um, and maintenance, maintenance of aircraft oversight. I also did a brief stint as head of flight operations, um, which was certification of all of our certificated Operators represented the CAA at um, F, F Federal Aviation and the ASA safety conferences. Um, there's a Pacific conference that's held every year when COVID's not around, and got involved with a whole bunch of bilateral negotiations and so forth, which absolutely nothing to do with engineering, everything to do with the, the, the leadership and um, uh, engagement piece that I mentioned before that I got from the Air Force. Current role Chief Executive of Merlin Labs. Um, we're building the next generation of the air network using software first approach. Uh, we're developing an autonomous aircraft that can seamlessly integrate with the existing aviation system. Um, but we're really conscious of following a crawl, walk, run approach and, and the, the importance of building social license for what we do at the same time as certification. And as I said, explain to a few things. Um, the smartest engineers in the world can design and build and certify all sorts of incredible things, but if the public aren't prepared to accept them, then there's, there's no point in doing it. So that's a big part of what we need to do as we move forward in aviation. Um, also, as the president of Royal Aeronautical Society, um, I'm responsible for maintaining a balance between the growth of our industry and, um, and also remembering where we came from. So there's a big part of the Royal Aero Society is, uh, is, is looking back at the history of aviation, both defence and civil in New Zealand and around the world. And so quite a bit of time is spent on, on both of those elements and they're both equally important. Um, we also offer pro professional reg registration for aeronautical engineers and have an amazing support network out of London for that. Um, and a lot of activity in the STEM and encouraging youth space because we also need to be focused on 2050s engineers and beyond. But that's not really what I want to talk about. Um, what I want to talk about is this and this is my little pet diagram. And look, the, the lines on the diagram aren't so important as the theme. Um, and just picking up on what a few of the speakers before me have said, um, it's, it's, it's not all there when you, you leave university, but a lot of it is. So I guess I, I wish uh, somebody had explained this to me really early in my professional career. Um, uh, in a way, when I've reflected on this presentation, um, it's what the Air Force's training was all about, but um, it, it would have been nice to have it explained in simple terms then. So. What this diagram is um, depicting, and hopefully you can see my pointer, is um, regardless of what you want to do, if you want to stay in engineering for the rest of your life, uh, or if you want to be the CEO of a company, um, there, there are three key elements to, to any role. Um, that is uh, core expertise, your professional field, and leadership. And what this diagram is kind of showing is that um, when you start up with a company, you leave university and you get a role in a company, you know, you're expected to have a level of uh, core expertise in your field, um, but the requirement for that level of expertise will drop off um, as time goes on. The worst CEOs are the ones that think they know all about um, design and engineering or whatever it is the field that they have. The best CEOs leave that to the experts or the, or the people who are still learning and, and directly engage with that. Um, so that's, that's the first point. Second point is your professional field, be it um, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, a regulatory professional, um, you really need to understand what it is that you do. And defense was really good at this because they, they taught us about what it meant to be a defense force professional. It wasn't just 
an engineer or a pilot or a, or a support person. Um, so, and that what this diagram is sort of showing is that, you know, when you're getting to sort of that manager project lead space, this is where you should be on your top of your game. You know the business really, really well. But again, chief executive um, needs to know the business, um, but doesn't need to be the expert in the business. And that's, again, what that person, he or she's team is for. And then finally, leadership. Um, and unfortunately, this diagram's been lost a little bit in translation, but um, what I'm trying to show here is that leadership actually shouldn't start at zero. Um, or anyone who gets through university has demonstrated leadership of themselves. You've been disciplined enough and you've led yourself through a really challenging um, uh, part of your life, um, but it is only the beginning and you need to keep that discipline going. Um, and as you go through your career, you need to focus on, on growing that leadership trait and it's, it's something that we engineers are uh, particularly notoriously bad at. Um, so no brainer, um, somebody in a CEO position or in a manager position needs to be a strong leader as well as an engineer and as well as a, a professional in their field. Um, so that's my little wisdom slide. Um, happy to take any questions on that later. Um, most important slide though is no matter where your career takes you, you make sure that you have fun and build friendships along the way. And I certainly have had um, plenty of opportunity for that in my time. Um, and I feel that my career has just begun. Cheers. Um, I stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before me, both in aviation and, and um, in engineering. Um, and those are my direct lineage, which is from the UK, and moved over late 2020. Um, so a little bit about me and my aerospace background. A glider pilot by background and by calling. It's a fantastic thing to do if you haven't had the chance already. Um, the experience of soaring and defying gravity as you aviate in a way that is a very um, in harmony with nature, whilst also getting to understand the, the aerospace and the, the involvement around you. So yeah, definitely a key one that everyone should try at least once. Um, I got a sponsorship through university um, doing an undergrad, uh, undergraduate master's in aerospace and aerothermal engineering. Um, I then went into the Royal Air Force as an engineering officer, which exposed me to a huge range of different um, opportunities, different aircraft types, different forms of um, technical expertise, but also that management and leadership stuff that Sean was just talking about um, on the previous presentation. And I think there's a, there's a real theme through a lot of that in that engineering is a balance of all of these things. So my kind of quip about the role is that as an engineer we fix things but as an, as an engineering manager we fix things using people. Um, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to go to the Empire Test Pilot School as a flight test engineer um, and that was most of 2015 for me so it was a 12-month course of hard work uh, interspersed by some very cool moments um, including flying with fast jets and getting the, getting the um, overview of how you take a trial and putting either putting something new on an aircraft or doing something novel with that aircraft um, and sorting that in a different way. So more about the role that I'm currently in. Um, came over to, the, to New Zealand in late 2020 and started as the Emerging Technologies Programme Manager at the CAA. So the, a, a theme through the presenters um, of this evening, but I'll, I'll just put the shout out that I'm, only, I'm the only one currently there. Um, and I wanted to highlight a few elements of that role um, that might not be obvious from the, the job title. It's very much a coordination piece. So the CAA works closely with um, the Ministry of Business and Innovation and Employment and Ministry of Transport also um, interlinked but slightly less closely with other areas um, both inside government and um, within industry itself and it's about understanding what what each side can bring to the party um, in order to be able to do that with any kind of credibility by um, turning up to um, to a meeting and getting that kind of engagement and understanding you walk in and have to establish your your credentials um, and part of the credentials that I believe helped me in that role are those of the professional rec recognition that I'll come to, come to in a minute. One of the major outputs of the work that we're doing at the moment is the airspace integration trials. 
which highlight the the opportunities for what we've got as an, an amazing um, airspace system here in New Zealand. And the partners um, highlighted on the slide there, um, Whisk and Kia, many more to come, definitely a watch this space. And if anybody's got any questions about that one, do just let me know, we'll definitely talk more. But I was talking about professional recognition, uh, pro sorry, professional registration and the recognition that that can give to you. So I registered and um, got involved in the Royal, Aer Royal Aeronautical Society as a student, which was a particular win because it was free um, and gave, gave me a lot of access into the, um, the tools and the engagement that was available. Um, I dropped out of it for a little bit, focused on um, the military elements of my early career and then came back to it as, as a need to um, establish those credentials that I can, on in a, um, a few a few words, um, demonstrate that I have a professional professionally recognised standard to which I've been held to, um, and that that brings you brings you into a system of mentorship. So you find your tribe wherever it is in the world that you go to, and I've been amazingly well supported by the New Zealand division of the Royal Arrows from day dot sending out across an email to into the Wellington branch saying, moving to Wellington, who else is out there? Um, it's been a really fantastic and supportive community. And I think that's something that potentially doesn't get highlighted that much. Um, but it's a form of investing in yourself. It's choosing to put that investment in both time, effort, and and there is a financial um, element to it. In, the, in terms of being then able to gain that um, mentor community and um, established credentials. So the three different levels just on the top of the slide there, Chartered Engineer, Incorporated Engineer um, and Engineering Technician, recognise that everybody can contribute um, and should be should deserve that professional registration element um, irrespective of the academic background that they might bring to it. So Best place to have a, having a look for that is the Royal Aeronautical Society website, um, and it links through. These ones are uh, par uh, parented by the Engineering Council of the UK. Just a shout out as we're taking over their talk time, um, Engineering New Zealand, another fantastic opportunity to gain that professional recognition, reg registration, um, and um, mentorship um, portfolio that comes with it. There are many other options as well. It doesn't really matter um, which route you take. It will push you. It will um, include you in those um, in the benefits that it, that you gain from it. So where to from here? Sorry, my slide appears to have disappeared. Probably because I've run out of time. Um, maths. <laughs> don't don't skimp on it. Um, it. It is the, the underlying fundamental and um, enables you to build build on it. Um, the same thing that I say to a lot of people who are looking at engineering as an option, don't skimp on the maths because by skimping at an early stage, you only set yourself up for more hard work further on. Um, plan what you want to do, but be flexible about it as well. So what, whatever your goals may be, med medals, work-life balance, um, graduation, plan for it and work with it. Um, a nod there to Alyssa Carson as somebody who's um, advertised as um, going for, shooting for the moon, or in her case, Mars, um, with a caveat that uh, NASA have distanced themselves from her as a uh, um, um, influencer. That's the word I was looking for. Um, but careers.gov.nz has a lot of um, information for engineering in general. And finally, believe in yourself. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, oh, I've got an Thanks very much, Rebecca. Okay, so um, those of us who've got the cameras on, we can leave them on. But what I was going to do, everyone, is just rattle through the questions. And um, if I can't answer them, I will pass them on and probably pass some of them on anyway, just for, just for fun. So there's a, there's a few questions there relating to Royal Aeronautical Society and, and what we do for students. And it's an excellent question. And I was hoping to hear that question. Um, actually, in the past, we uh, have 
um, been involved with the Wonder Projects program. Andrew in particular has um, given up a lot of her time to some student events around Wellington. Um, the Wellington branch of the society does a lot of work in the space, but to be fair, as a society, it's an area we've recognised we need to put a lot more effort into. Um, and we have a strategic planning um, exercise coming up in the next few weeks, and this is going to be um, a key element of what we're going to discuss. That said, um, we're, we are actually working with other like-minded organisations, and this, is, this connection today is a great example of that, um, where we're hoping to um, work together to get the best bang for our buck out of how we invest our time. And um, I guess the one thing that we all recognise is that New Zealand's too small to have four or five different professional bodies all trying to do the same thing. So it's all about working together and, and seeing who focuses on what. Um, there's another question there that's actually to me. Um, do I miss being a practical engineer and using your core experience uh, expertise? Um, I love that question because I ran away while the camera's off to grab this. And I've got this. I'm a total geek um, in my spare time, so uh, no, I, I, I don't miss it because it's a hobby. Um, but what I have got to later in life is flying, and um, like Rebecca, uh, I'm, um, I'm a really enthusiastic pilot, and uh, unlike Rebecca, I'm still training because she's a, she's a fantastic glider pilot, so she can land first time every time, whereas I get the opportunity to turn the engine back on and, and go around, so, so yeah, I'm still learning. Um, what else have we got there? Scholarships. Um, uh, we don't have anything in the way of scholarships for all the aeronautical society at the moment. Uh, we do in the flying space, but not for engineering. Um, and I guess the important point to note there is Royal Aeros is about aerospace um, and all its guises. And there's a quite a heavy bent to flying over the last few years. So we support the Walsh Flying um, Academy every year, which is a scouts lead um, event. But um, a whole bunch of young people get to learn how to fly at that event. Um, if anyone else sees questions they want to answer, jump in. Hi, this as well, Sean. Yes, were... Just wanted to point out the Royal Aeronautical oh, Society's yes. uh, prizes. Um, so whilst they might not be a scholarship, there are there are the, yeah, the route to investing in And um, so that's in a, uh, a thing that we do every year is that we do have a, a trust fund that we invest in and young people and um, what we can do is we can provide some links to the website to show you what that's all about as well. Um, question, there's a question there for you Beth, what, what advice do you have for someone interested in getting to Formula One? Um, move to the UK. <laughs> that's not a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a very good answer. Um, so in aer I've got an aerospace engineering degree and most um, most of the engineers in F1 will have that degree, um, if not a postgrad as well, um, a doctorate um, in aerodynamics of some description of fluid dynamics. Um, and then it's a case of, yeah, just um, following, I guess it's um, persistence. And I, I, I tried to make it clear and when I was talking, it's about relationships. Um, it's about having a meeting and following up and friend of a friend and, and following those relationships through as, as quickly as much as you can um, and networking and I think as just as Rebecca talked about when she moved countries um, and same with Andrea when you know when people move it's all about developing that network um, and then taking it from there um, yeah there's, there's there's not much in New Zealand with respect to Formula One there um, uh, and the other thing too is I can't is, see the question. Is, is Formula One sure. like um, aviation is, is going towards the electric side? So electrical engineers are pretty in short demand around the world. So um, that might be another area, a, a way to get in. Um, which uh, sort of a segue to another question, and I'm, I'm happy to open this up. And I think, Andrea, maybe you've done something in the space, or maybe sell the, uh, the carbon neutral, carbon zero. Um, what sort of work is being done um, from an aviation design perspective? Uh, other than some of the electrical aircraft and hydrogen uh, cell aircraft. Uh, and there's been some work done on some uh, some of the fuels. I think in New Zealand was involved some time ago. Uh, but there's, there's still a long way to go in terms of the running of the aeroplanes or powering the aeroplanes. But the, an area that's of interest to me is, uh, is the materials that are utilised for the manufacture of the aircraft. Um, I know that, uh, for example, on um, on 787 and uh, and uh, other uh, programs, uh, we had to make sure that uh, 
anything that was considered dangerous or carcinogenic that was okay maybe 10 years earlier that weren't called up on our drawing specs or our uh, material processes. So um, um, when I was in Melbourne, I first went back to Melbourne, uh, we had baths the size of literally swimming pools. There's all sorts of things in there and they were eventually closed down somewhere metal to metal bonding and all sorts of things. So that stuff has slowly been moved away. Um, but there's still obviously uh, a, a long way to go in particular when it comes to recycling all materials and what do you do with all the carbon composites uh, with uh, parts and you know when you start to go into repairs and things like that. Great, but thanks. So there people. are a few questions from people on um, that are looking be chemical and so forth about what sort of opportunities open up there. Um, one of the one of the roles I have as president of Royal Aeronautical Society is is tuning into the London Council meetings um, on a regular basis. In fact, the last one was last night. We went till one o'clock this morning. Um, so uh, the key focus for the council at the moment is the uh, paper that's just been released in the UK on um, their carbon zero plan, um, and they have a very aggressive transport plan to be carbon zero by twenty fifty. Um, and so the council's primary focus last night was on how we're going to contribute to that effort. Um, a lot of discussion on biofuels versus synthetic fuels and um, quite interestingly the um, environmental knock-on effects of biofuels taking up space that people need to grow food. Um, and uh, yes, there's still a lot of opportunity in that space for any of you um, who are doing chemical uh, engineering. Um, or any related field um, uh, to get into. So that, that's certainly something to do some reading on, but it's a very aggressive timeline to get our uh, carbon footprint down. Um, and so now is the time to be getting into that. Uh, advice on mentoring. Um, anyone on, from the floor would like to take that one? Yeah. I'm happy to maybe jump in on that. Um, I know at one point in my career, actually, when I was still at the Civil Aviation Authority, Beth and I actually attended an event and happened to meet somebody at Air New Zealand uh, who we spoke to about mentoring at that point in time. Um, so she managed to find out a little bit more about us and tried to pair us up with people who she thought might be good mentors. And I would say when it comes to mentor, the, the, the fit is really, really important. The person on paper might look like amazing and you can learn a lot from them. And it's not to say that you can't, but if you don't quite have that connection, personally, where you feel comfortable um, kind of being vulnerable and putting yourself out there about what you're going through, that I would say is the more important point, that you have that kind of connection with them. Um, and I would also just say that you can have mentors for different aspects of your life. You don't need to have one mentor that kind of covers everything that you're going through. You can have somebody who's a bit more geared towards your professional life and what you might need assistance with there versus, you know, other aspects too. So I would say, yeah, don't be afraid to have more than one mentor and don't be afraid to potentially walk away from a mentor relationship that could just... Andrea, right also, somebody missed the beginning of your presentation. I just wanted to know your job title again, please. Keep your system Thank you. Um, I'm just looking through the questions. Uh, there's a question on integration of Royal Aeronautical Society and Eng New Zealand um, in terms of registration and information. Um, uh, yeah, that's a great question, uh, and it is, uh, I guess, integration uh, versus information sharing versus working closely together is something that um, I think we're going to get together and discuss. We need to have our own strategy discussion first um, for New Zealand, um, but we're certainly uh, fundamental to who we are is, is growing um, uh, engineering aerospace professionals in New Zealand, um, so anything we can do to further that we will be interested in, so that's certainly something we'd look at. Um, and everyone else, just if you see a question you want to answer, jump in. I've seen one here about certification of autonomous, I assume it means aircraft in New Zealand. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, there's there's two parts to that, that challenge. Uh, there's the technical certification and then there's the social license challenge. Um, so to answer the question directly, uh, the Civil Aviation Authority of New Zealand is responsible for certification of autonomous um, aircraft um, and there are a bunch of rules in New Zealand that allow that. Um, in fact, uh, around the world where New Zealand is pretty much world leading um, because they have a very clever rule called Part 102 which enables all sorts of um, things in the autonomous space. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a free pass, actually in some ways it's harder. So um, uh, it's a robust process um, but again uh, there's a couple of fundamental issues. One is, and, and Rebecca, you can jump in if you like, 
because you know I'm good at me. But uh, it's not just a certification of the technology, it's the detect and avoid for other users of the airspace, for birds, for terrain, and, and thirdly, it's the social license piece that I mentioned before that, you know, like any new advancement in technology, and we just think of the autonomous cars a few years ago, right, self-driving cars, if people don't understand it and don't trust it, they won't use it. So it's not commercially viable. Um, Rebecca, do you want to add anything else on that? Only to um, to come and engage with the CAA at an early opportunity once you've got a fixed design of what it is that you want to do. And also, there's quite a lot of stuff that's um, available on out of the rules. So the rule set's all available and, and fully published. Um, so just engage, ask, yep. the, ask the right I'm questions. I'm also involved with uh, Aerospace Christchurch, um, which is a great... Uh, is a, have a look at the website. They have great presentations. It's another one of those professional bodies that's growing in New Zealand. Um, and one of the things that we're considering um, is, uh, as a sort of an adjunct to that, is a, a body of uh, aerospace professionals that can provide their time uh, free to uh, university students who've got great ideas um, and want to know how to certify them or how to get them into market. Um, and I'm already involved with a couple of Canterbury pro university projects where there's some people have got some really interesting aviation ideas and I'm just sort of helping them out from a how would you think about getting this through a certification path approach? So again, something that we're trying to grow here in New Zealand. Um, there's one here. So what, um, still on the student side. So um, what can Royal Aero... There's a few questions about what can the Royal Aeronautical Society do to support students, um, and we do need to highlight the fact that a, uh, whilst you're at university, your membership of the society is free, um, and that was a fantastic opportunity for me, um, and I would definitely encourage people to do that one. Um, particularly, someone's asked about they are an engineering student with an interest in aeronautics. Have a look and at those. And we have a symposium uh, every year, and uh, this year's symposium will be in Christchurch. Um, we just decided that last night uh, on the 29th of October um, and we are just forming a committee at the moment on um, what the topics will be but we're always um, focused on uh, technology um, and how we grow aviation um, or aerospace in New Zealand so uh, stand by for an announcement on the, the what those presentations will entail shortly. Um, Students, is, have I missed any? Sorry, it was the 29th of October for the symposium. Just confirming that. <laughs> no, you didn't. I know somebody asked the question. So like three times, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, thankfully somebody was awake. Uh, um, could be a good question to potentially finish up, I'm just noting the time, finishing up on. Um, somebody's asked, looking back at your career up to now, what would you say to a fresh graduate looking to follow in yeah. your footsteps? That could be a good one to go through, maybe everyone. Here. Sal, do you want to start? Who wants? Yeah. Sorry? Do you want me to start? Uh, look, I love my job. I love engineering. Uh, I have no regrets about doing aeronautical engineering. Um, uh, go for it. Uh, I think some of the things that, uh, you know, some of the themes about uh, relationships and uh, mentoring uh, are going to be critical. Uh, you need to, uh, I think it's on all senior engineers and as you move on in your career, finding somebody that can uh, give you a lot of lessons learned and, uh, and a lot of advice as you move forward and not just technically in terms of what's my job, how do, how do I tackle that problem, but also how to develop uh, as an individual. Uh, so uh, it, it's important that you start that, um, that early because uh, engineering is, is a big, big term. Uh, and as you've sort of heard through the presentations, it covers a lot of things. So, you know, it'll help you get an understanding of what's involved. I mean, for me, my best education was at Pacific Aerospace, small organisation uh, where you're not, you weren't directly shielded from uh, commercial pressures, schedule pressures, technical problems. Uh, it certainly set me up for a good grounding and uh, 
a lot of the people there were very good to me. So it's um, you know it gives you confidence to move forward, to stand up on your own two feet, and uh, you know to be able to uh, look at problems, uh, whether they are you know uh, personal problems from the point of view of work in, in an environment or whether they be technical problems. So uh, yeah, get in early and form those okay. relationships. Aim high, go for it, and don't be afraid to change what it is that you're aiming for. Andrea. <laughs> Words right out of my mouth. I was going to say um, a lot of people think you know it's a career ladder and you have to kind of stick with one thing and keep moving up the rungs, but um, as you can see from my career, it's a bit more of a career jungle gym um, jumping around. So yeah, if something doesn't quite feel right. Don't be afraid to try something new, and you might not like that either. But you know, you can always come back, or you know, continue trying different things until you find what you like. Don't feel like you need. And Beth. Um, I guess just coming back to what I previously said, that word relationships really matter. Um, finding an engineering e role—that's my new word—that um, you can do and enjoy it is only part of the puzzle. Um, but surrounding yourself by like-minded and that value aligned aligning to your values um, and only you know what they are um, and supportive people um, that's what keeps me getting up in the morning and I've it took me a while to get there in my career to find um, I guess my, my, my place in the world essentially um, yeah so to me yeah relationships matter um, who you work with matters and I agree with all of that um, and the two bits that I guess I focus on were in my slides it's um, find balance um, Remember that it's not just about um, core engineering, it's also about um, being a leader of yourself and others, um, and even if that's just um, influencing how, how we think in a better way. Um, and then the other element is knowing the business that you're in. Um, it's really important to, um, to know the business that you're in and to understand why you're in that business. Um, and then I guess the final thing for me is have fun. Um, if, if you don't enjoy it, uh, it's, it's a... You know, it's a, it's a long time in a role if you don't enjoy it. So um, try and make the most of what you do and have fun. And that's, I think, a good way to end. So uh, thanks very much. I hope hope this has been useful. Apologies if I've missed any of the questions. Um, we would uh, happily answer any other questions that you have offline. Um, so I, I think the team knows how to get a hold of us. And yeah, look forward to uh, hopefully seeing some of you at the Royal Arrows event at the end of the